Good morning. Welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I am your host, Marie Bernard, and we have a fabulous guest today, Paul Rademacher. He is the executive director of the Monroe Institute and also the author of A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Welcome to the show, Paul Rademacher. Hi. Hi, Marie. Great to be with you. How are you doing today? Fabulous, fabulous. We've got great weather here in Virginia. Oh, we do too here in Vancouver. It's a beautiful day. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, So we're going to talk today about your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, um, and you are also the executive director of the Monroe Institute. Um, Maybe some listeners don't know what the Monroe Institute is, so can you tell us a little bit about what the Monroe Institute is and what you do there as executive director? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, the best place to start probably to talk about the Monroe Institute is to talk about uh, Bob Monroe and, and what what his work was all about. <clears throat> he, um, back in the 1950s, uh, was involved in, in radio. He was a very prolific uh, writer and producer of radio shows, and at one point in his career he was vice president of Mutual Broadcasting System. But I think it was back in 1956, uh, he was uh, working with sound because they were trying to see if people could learn to uh, while they were sleeping, and so they developed these sound patterns to help people get to sleep. In the middle of this experimentation, he was kind of his own um, subject in some cases. He suddenly had a spontaneous out-of-body experience, and in that in that state, he found himself above his bed, looking down at his body, and he got very terrified of that experience and was absolutely convinced that he was dying. And so uh, he swam back down through the air and, and got back into his body and sat up and was breathing heavy, and his heart was pounding. And uh, went through a number of tests, both psychologically and physically, to see if there was something wrong with him. But after the test came back, it said that he was okay. He got very curious about this thing because it kept happening to him. And so uh, because he was working with sound, he began to wonder if there was some way that he could use sound to help to control these out-of-body experiences and perhaps even to help other people to begin to explore these states of awareness as well. And it was out of that work that he eventually created uh, the Hemisync technology and then also created the Monroe Institute, which is a nonprofit organization which uh, we are dedicated to providing the experience and the context for people to begin to explore altered states of awareness, not just in the out-of-body experience, but any of the ranges of, of um, unusual perception that are, we are capable as, as human beings. Wonderful. And so your background, you were a minister, and tell us a little bit about how you got involved. You you had uh, an accident that kind of Mm -hmm. got you, gave you a a look at the mystical, and from there you went on to study theology. So can you tell us a little bit about what led you to the Monroe Institute? Yes, it's it's kind of a long story, so I'll I'll give you the Reader's Digest version on this. when I was, this was back in 1981, I, w- I was um, working up on the roof of a house that my brother and I were building. We had a construction company. And I was pulling on a board, and, and all of a sudden the board gave way it, in an unexpected way, and I found myself careening off the roof. I didn't have any time to adjust for the fall and landed on a pile of, of gravel. And though I didn't know it at the time, I had fractured my left hip. And oh, they came in and took me to the hospital and in the ambulance, and every time they moved me, I just about blacked out from the pain. And they took some x-rays, but they didn't find anything wrong with the hip, and so they put me into physical therapy, which, because I did have a fractured hip, was absolutely excruciating. And after a while, the doctor came by, and he said, you don't look like you're doing too well. And I said, no, I'm really not. So they did some more x-rays, found out that it was indeed fractured, took me out of physical therapy, and put me into traction. And when they, the doctor told me that I was going to be off work for a number of weeks, I felt myself going into this spiral downward of pain and anxiety, pain because the hip was agonizing, but also anxiety because this was the busiest time of our construction year and there was no way I could possibly be off work. So as I was spiraling downward, all of a sudden I felt myself breaking through into this other reality. And it was, I was completely unprepared for it because I'd never experienced anything like this before in my life. And in that other reality, the, uh, the pain that I was feeling completely disappeared. The anxiety dissipated in, entirely. And I found myself surrounded by complete and total and utter peace. 
and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were no such things as accidents. Everything had meaning and purpose. And then at one point, I was standing in front of this being of light, and we were conversing about my life, yet we weren't using words. And as you can imagine, when I came out of that experience, it was so uh, amazing to me because uh, if, if I had heard of that kind of thing, it certainly wasn't available to an ordinary contractor like me. But here I was, uh, moving into this mystical realm that was so far beyond my imagination that uh, all I could, I couldn't even find the words to describe it. So when I came out of that, I, I felt like uh, this was the answer to a question I had been wrestling with, which was, should I or should I not go to seminary? Because I had a real strong sense of calling into the ministry. And uh, I thought, well, obviously this is the, the voice of God. So I went off and took my wife and, and at that time two children and went to Princeton Theological Seminary. And I graduated from there with a Master of Divinity degree in 1985. And then I became a uh, Presbyterian pastor for 15 years. But the, the main thing was that even though I was in the pastorate, there was this, this continual hunger to want to get back to that world that I had fallen into when I fell off the roof. And I think in so many ways that was the beginning for me of, of a really a lifelong quest to try and engage this world again and to, to understand it more, more completely and find ways to access it more consistently in my life. In your book, I'm, I was reading your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, and I can imagine that it must have been difficult for you because as I was reading the book, you were talking about how you were having these these experiences and searching for the the mystical experience that you had, and you weren't really finding it in... Right. Right in the church, in the religious format, um, and then also that you were having a, a hard time once you were able to explore this more through the Monroe Institute, you weren't able to openly discuss it with your congregation. Well, you know, it's a strange thing about the ministry that uh, uh, people are pretty possessive about their about their pastors, and they, they there's sort of a mold that you, you, you need to fit into. It's it's kind of an uns, unspoken mold, and mostly they want you to appear, at least appear to be normal. And in my case, that wasn't necessarily the truth at all because I was so interested in these other other realms. And and you know, when you start to talk about these things that that sort of go outside the mainstream, it gets a little risky if you want to keep your job and, and and at this time now I've got three children and I've got a wife to support and um even though I wasn't happy in the ministry because my heart was pulling me in this other direction I really felt compelled to stay in it so that I could continue to to you know uh, feed the feed my family and uh, there were so many times when when I would want to say something but I but I just couldn't do it for because of the risk and so I ended up really kind of couching the things that I that I would say for those who, as Jesus said, those who have ears so that they could hear them, and those who didn't have the ears just, just wouldn't understand at all what I was saying. Uh, my wife, Jackie, would stand beside me sometimes when I when I was greeting people after the service, and people would say, oh, that was just the most wonderful sermon. That was just great. And she would whisper in my ear, and she would say, if they had any idea of what you were really saying, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to keep your job. And, and I think in some cases she w that was true. But at the end of end of my ministry, I left the ministry in the year 2000. I actually started doing some of, some of the uh, Monroe Institute uh, of technology for a very small group in the church, and w I was so amazed because um, for them it, it was opening up these new worlds that had opened up for me as well, and I began to see how compelling it was for them. And it was at that point that I began to realize that this is the work I really want to do. This is the really significant stuff. And I really think that, that uh, this work, and this is the theme of my book, that this work is really about opening up what I think Jesus meant by the kingdom of heaven, which is this, this, um, these worlds that are available to us as ordinary human beings that we simply uh, dismiss most of our lives, but are really part of our, our, our birthright as human beings. Wonderful. Well, if you want to get on the air and ask a question, we are speaking with... Paul Rademacher, R Rademacher? Rademacher. Rademacher, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Paul Rademacher, he is the executive director of the Monroe Institute, and they are pretty much the foremost authority on out-of-body experiences. So if you have a, that is true, right? 
Well, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that we, we would uh, pass ourselves as, as the foremost authority on anything. Uh, and I'll tell you the reason why is because we, we really want uh, people to become their own authorities. And so we try very hard not to provide the answers for people, but simply to create the context in which they can explore for themselves. And then on the basis of their own experience, they can put together the pieces and use the language and the, and the um, sort of the context that makes the most sense for them. And so we don't consider ourselves to be gurus. We're just um, ordinary people who are um, offering an experience to people. Wonderful. Fair enough. All right. Well, if you have a question about out-of-body experiences, meditation, consciousness, give us a call at 604-822-2487. We're speaking with Paul Rademacher. He's the executive director of the Monroe Institute and also author of a wonderful book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. We'll be back with more synchronicity in just a moment. The 10th anniversary Vancouver Air National Dance Festival is taking place March 12th to March 21st at the Vancouver Playhouse and Roundhouse venues. The 2010 lineup includes Vancouver Company's Mascal Dance, Kokoro Dance, Lumenco Rosario, and Out Inner Space. Ontario's Toronto Dance Theatre, Taiwan's Lafa and Artists, Denmark's Kit Johnson, New Zealand's Black Grace and Bill Crutchmaster Shannon, Michael Sakamoto, and Evidence from the United States. The 10th anniversary Vancouver Air National Dance Festival. March 12th to March 21st at the Vancouver Playhouse and Roundhouse venues. Tickets are available at 604-662-4966 or online at vidf.ca. Welcome back to Synchronicity. Talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. I hope you're having... A wonderful Friday morning. It's a great day here in Vancouver, and we're speaking with Paul Rademacher. He is the executive director of the Monroe Institute and author of A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. He's here today to talk about his book, as well as out-of-body experiences, meditation, consciousness, all of that juicy, mystical stuff. So if you have a question and you want to get on the air, the number is 604 822 Four eight seven. That's six zero four U B C C I T R. You can also email me spiritual show at gmail dot com. Or if you're listening online and you're on Twitter, you can Twitter me. My name there is spiritual show as well, and I'll pass your question on to Paul. Welcome back, Paul. Hey, thank you, Marie. So I'm I'm so excited to to speak with you about out of body experiences and meditation and hemi sync. Um, that's the one thing that the Monroe Institute, Paul, uh, you can you tell us more? I'm losing my train of thought here. Can you tell us about what is HemiSync and how does sure. it help people do stuff? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the HemiSync technology is, is based on something that we call binaural beats. And uh, the way that works is, um, and this is a very simplified explanation of it, uh, it what we do is we uh, put headphones on, on our participants, or they put them on themselves, and and then uh, we will put one tone in the right ear, and then we'll put a, a second tone in the left ear that's just a little bit difference in pitch or frequency. And when you have two frequencies that are very close in pitch or very uh, close in their in their um, the cycles per second, there will be sort of a wavering sound. If you've ever tuned an instrument or tuned a guitar, when those two notes get very, very close but not exact, there is, there is a sort of a wavering or a wah, 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 wah kind of sound. And that is uh, actually a sound that's produced in the brain when you have headphones on. And that third tone is what we call the hemi-sync process. So when that third tone is being manufactured in the brain, the brain, it tends to create an environment in which the, the brain can then move to a different state uh, of um, awareness or a different homeostasis from the ordinary waking state. And so uh, what we will do is we will take use this technology, which is much more complex than what I just described it, but we will use this technology to take people to different destination points. So, for instance, when you come to the Gateway Voyage, which is our introductory um, program at the Institute, 
we, the first destination point that we take people to is what we call Focus 10. And the reason why we use numbers for these different uh, points is because we wanted to uh, have something that didn't have any particular associations with it so that people wouldn't be front-loaded in their expectations so that they could go with a, an open mind just to see what, the, what would happen. Focus 10 is what we call the state of mind awake and body asleep. Ordinarily, when, when we get more and more progressively relaxed, as say for instance when you're going to sleep at night, your body will get more and more relaxed and then you'll come across this threshold. And when you cross this threshold, all of a sudden you lose consciousness of your normal waking body and awareness and you move into these other ranges of experience that uh, you might remember later on as a dream or a lucid dream or a vision or something like that. And, but you, but while you're having that dream or lucid dream or vision, you're you're really not aware that you have another life that you call uh, this life in this physical world. But what we do in Focus Ten is we allow people to cross over that threshold where they would normally lose consciousness, and they we help them to maintain their normal waking consciousness so that they can begin to explore the richness and the wonder of the unconscious world. And as you can imagine, uh, that that opens up quite a cornucopia of experiences that we normally uh, ignore and pay very little attention to in our society. So that's the first destination point that we take people to. The second one is, is what we call Focus 12, and Focus 12 is the state of expanded awareness, which is awareness beyond the confines of the five senses or beyond the confines of the physical body. And then we uh, go to focus 15, which is the state beyond time and sometimes beyond space. And the last destination point that we take people to is what we call focus 21. And that is the bridge state between physical uh, matter, existence, and perception, and non-physical uh, perception. And so, and again, you can imagine that that opens up quite a, an array of experiences as well. So, Paul, when you... That's the gateway experience, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. that's so correct. that's the introductory experience at the Monroe Institute. So what if you've been attending for a long time or you're someone like yourself who is really involved with the Monroe Institute? Does it go beyond Focus 21? Oh, yes. Yes, we have a number of uh, what we call graduate programs. And I, th I'm, I haven't counted them up recently, but if I had to guess, I suspect we probably have maybe 15 other programs that people can engage in. <clears throat> and it's, and it's a, a great variety of things. For instance, um, we have a, a guidelines program where people can get uh, in touch with their uh, own personal guidance. And uh, they can also get a, a lab session in our, our booth as a part of that program in our laboratory. Uh, another program that we have is a, a lifeline program where we teach people to work with those who have recently deceased and uh, help them to move on to other, uh, their next experiences. We have uh, something we call Exploration 27, uh, which uh, it explores the richness of Focus 27. Um, we have MC Squared, where people can work with issues of psychokinesis and, and uh, manipulating the physical world in various ways. Ooh, tell so, us about that one. That sounds juicy. <laughs> that one, uh, the focus of the program uh, is to give people uh, fairly immediate feedback on their attempts to uh, use their mind to uh, to affect the world around them. The program actually had its beginning. Dr. Joe Gallenberger would uh, take people to Las Vegas and um, take them to the craps table in La Las Vegas and to see if they could affect the dice roll. And what they would do is they would move into altered states of awareness, and then they would ring the uh, table and then uh, see if they could uh, affect the dice roll in a way that was uh, was profitable. And um, and so he figured you know, if you could do it in Las Vegas, you could probably do it just about anywhere. And so then that became the basis of the program that we do here. We don't uh, do gambling here at the Institute, but we do, uh, uh, do – they have different methods of, of testing uh, people's abilities in that way. For instance, affecting uh, seeds that might be growing, bending spoons, throwing dice – uh, lighting light bulbs uh, with your with your uh, hands and that kind of thing. So um, it's it's kind of a fun program for a lot of people. Another one that we have is a remote viewing program. Um, also, 
a program where we work with uh, Peter Russell, who is the author of the, the Global Brain and many other books, and, and he does something with Karen Malik called Exploration Essence. And uh, we have Silent Retreat, so uh, a Heartline program for exploring uh, relationships in the heart, and so on and so forth. Wow, that sounds amazing. I, I'm, I have a question about Vegas. So you don't actually have to get into because if you're standing at a craps table in Vegas and you start to like look like you're meditating or doing something weird, they're going to notice, right? So, well, actually, they they do notice the the groups that go there. Uh, I haven't been there myself, so I can't really speak from firsthand experience. But uh, from what I've heard, the uh, casinos actually like it when the when the groups come through because it seems to generate a lot of interest. Uh, and you know, anytime when when uh, it's flowing in in an exciting direction, that tends to draw a crowd, and and they like that at the casinos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I would have expected, like in the movies, they'd take you out back and break your legs or something. <laughs> we haven't had any injuries that I know of. Actually, I shouldn't say we, because it's really not our program that goes out to Las Vegas. It's it's Dr. Gallenberger's program. Okay, great. So I, I want to talk about also the remote viewing how does one, I guess you have to go to the Monroe Institute to find out, but what kind of, do you actually look at some other space and time? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so the idea behind re- remote view- viewing um, actually began with the military back in, I think, the, the 1970s. Um, and Skip Atwater, who's our, our president of the Institute, was uh, uh, the person who started the remote viewing program with the, with the Army. And he was with it for, uh, it was called the Stargate program, and he was with it for the 18 years of its existence. And then after that, came and, and worked, after he retired from the military, he came and worked at the Institute, and he's the one that has put together this remote viewing program. And the idea behind, and just so everybody knows, we have no connection with the military whatsoever. Uh, it, it haven't had any for connection with them for over 20 years, so... Um, the remote viewing program is designed to retrieve information independent of time and space so that uh, you can move into this state of awareness when, uh, and you would be given a target that you would not know anything about. Uh, it, some of them use what they call coordinate remote viewing, where they give you a latitude and a longitude, and then you can uh, simply go to that spot in your mind and see what kind of information you perceive and, and then work with a monitor and either draw what you see or, or write words out or just to, to give your impressions. turns out that a lot of people have this ability and they may not be aware of it, but some people are better at it than others. And, and so this program is, is an opportunity for people to begin to explore what that might mean for them and to have some fun and, and uh, to see uh, what their abilities might be. So could you use remote viewing to, like, go on vacation without leaving your house? <laughs> Would you, like, go just hang out at the beach or Paris or wherever? Well, you know, actually, we do that all the time, though we may not be aware of it. Uh, for instance, if you ever had the experience of driving down the road and you're on, a, on the, the highway in an interstate, and suddenly you realize you've been driving for an hour and you have no idea what has transpired in between. Well, in fact, you probably have been either thinking about the future, uh, worrying about what's going to happen, or you've been rehashing something that has happened in the past. And while you're doing that, you actually exist in that other realm so much so that you're not even aware of the fact that you're still driving the car. And and it's it's somewhat similar in, in that regard. It's, it's like... Uh, uh, being able to go into that state of reverie or that that uh, light hypnotic state and simply learn how to navigate that to uh, to uh, a better extent so that you can begin to retrieve information. So in some ways, it's not as exotic as what we might think about it because it's 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 actually a very normal human function. So when you say that you exist in that other place when you're worrying or thinking about the future or whatever, mm-hmm. are you talking about? like multi-dimensional realities? I think so. I think so. And again, that, that's not as exotic as what you might think either, because if you, if you consider the fact that where you are right now and where I am right now, uh, there are all kinds of radio waves and television frequencies that are, that are moving right through your body at this, at this very point in time. You don't notice those, and yet if you had a radio or if you had a television, you could tune the frequency to that particular 
uh, station or that particular uh, television program, and you could be very absorbed in that reality right now. Even though your physical body is still living in this physical reality, your mind is somewhere else. And uh, But because maybe you're not sitting in front of a television or a radio, you're not, simply not aware of that. But that doesn't change the fact that all of those other realities are impinging upon your experience right now. So it's it's not a very far stretch to begin to imagine that that there are other uh, dimensions that are available to us beyond radio and television that uh, we are simply not aware of, except for the fact that if we begin to tune our attention to them, then they can begin to open up to us and we can begin to interact and explore them. Very interesting. Well, it's time for another break, so we'll be back in just a moment. We're speaking with Paul Rademacher. He is the executive director of the Monroe Institute. They teach about out-of-body experiences, meditation, um, exploring consciousness. He's also the author of A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. We'll be back with more synchronicity in just a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, the body and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. Thanks for being with me today. It is a beautiful day here in Vancouver, and I'm so excited to be speaking with our guest, Paul Rademacher. He's the executive director of the Monroe Institute. Oh, it looks like we have a caller on the line. Hi, caller. What's your question? Hi there. Yeah, um, my question is just something that I had thought about a little while ago. It's concerning the, the phenomenon of deja vu and uh, how that the possibility that when you are experiencing deja vu, um, it is like entering into an altered state where somehow be, maybe another plane of your existence had actually been in that particular situation before um like if we are there are multiple places of existence where you, we're only conscious of one but perhaps in an alternate reality um we had already been to that location and the moment of experiencing a deja vu is where these sort of parallel universes intersect for a brief instant and we become conscious of that is that even i don't know is there a better explanation or any explanation for the for the phenomenon of deja vu? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for it. Um, when you uh, look at these kinds of issues, I, I, one of the things that I think you always have to begin to deal with is the issue of time. We tend to take a very glib view of time and, and assume that, that time is always moving in a from the past to the future. But in, in when you look at uh, the literature from the mystics and uh, the people that have been talked about from from the from the very beginning, there's always this idea that that time is an illusion and that everything is one. And, and rather than things moving from the past to the future, everything is is in this eternal now, which is the present. I suspect that the deja vu experience may have something to do with that, that we are simply uh, moving not so much in a linear uh, progression of time, but experiencing time in a, in a different fashion. I was just uh, on another radio uh, interview, and the host was telling me about an experience, for instance, where he was one day out in his backyard, and and he was tossing the, the ball with his son, and all of a sudden, the, the his son tossed tossed him the ball, and the ball uh, just froze in, in midair. Everything around him was frozen for several seconds, and nothing was moving. There was no sound whatsoever. The world was completely still, and then all of a sudden, it kicked back in again, and the ball moved, and he caught the ball. And no one around him had any sense whatsoever that there had been any interruption in that, that flow of time. But he did, and in fact, that had actually happened to him twice in his life. And it's a very interesting thing when when that kind of experience happens, because then you realize that that um, this thing that we call time is not nearly as so structured as what we are led to believe. And I suspect that the deja vu experience may be one of those moments. I know that they can explain it from um, a neurological perspective, but I think there's a deeper mystery to it, and and I think it has to do with this. Uh, really strange sense of time that um, may be different from what we've been taught. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, the moment it's sort of interesting where it, it is just that 
the perception of time in our conscious mind predominantly is the one where I think we think of it as linear, right? We we right. we, we right. see our our personal narrative arc in a straightforward fashion from birth to death, and it goes from A to B kind of thing. But right. all those other possible planes of consciousness that we are n- not conscious of, of um, you know, we could be trans, we could be crossing those sort of timelines um, at, at every different, at every instance. Absolutely, yeah. I, and I think I think that's a very interesting thing that you bring up. I, so I, I appreciate your comment on that. I hope you continue to explore and, and find your own answers to that too. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks for calling in. That was a fantastic question. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, I love that. So deja vu. I I used to experience deja vu a lot as a kid, and I don't experience Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, Do you have any thoughts on why that might be? Well, I, I, of course, I don't know the answers to a lot of these questions, so, but I can speculate. And my speculation is that, that, you know, when we come into this world as children, we're much more open to the more mystical aspects of existence. I mean, you probably have heard of or maybe even know some children who have, for instance, imaginary friends. Um, but they're, they're told usually by their parents that those are imaginary. Of course, anything that's imaginary, we immediately classify as being unreal. And so we get educated into this sort of specific way of looking at the world and interacting with it. And the more we come into the adult mind, the more we forget that as children that there was a magical world that was opened up to us where anything was possible. But as adults, we that, that world gets more and more narrow to the point where because we feel like we have to fit in and operate within this particular culture, that there's not much room for that more magical, mystical aspect of, of uh, what we knew so well when we were children. So I think it's probably not very surprising that you would have had more deja vu experiences as a child. Great, thanks. Well, I wanted to ask you also about, is it the Lifeline program? So you're helping mm-hmm. ghosts. Is that kind of like Ghost Whisperer? <laughs> um, this, this program actually began uh, by accident. Um, Robert Monroe, uh, this is, remember this was back in, in the 1960s, and um, this was before the whole New Age movement uh, made some of this stuff more mainstream in its in in the conversation, but uh, he he would put people in his laboratory uh, isolation booth and use these sound patterns to help them to move into altered states of awareness, and uh, they would encounter really strange experiences at times, and, and one of the um, more strange experiences happened when one of the explorers, who was Rosie McKnight, uh, found herself... Uh, by the way, when she would go into these states, she wouldn't even be aware of what what was happening. She'd have to come back, and they would they would play the recording, and then she would find out what had transpired while she was off doing something else. So um, there was um, another figure who came into her body and began to work, and then they found uh, themselves in the situation where they were rescuing a sailor who had uh, died in a shipwreck, but it wasn't aware that that he had passed away. And so he was floating on this log, and and, uh, this was such a surprise because Bob Monroe was the one who was being the monitor, and Bob Monroe was sitting at at his um, control panel talking over the microphone to this other person who wasn't aware that they had died. And he found himself in the process of actually helping this person to move on to their next step. Now, mind you, this was not something that he had conceived of before. It was his first encounter, and it completely threw him off off balance. And and, um, he didn't quite know what to do, but he found him sort of uh, muddled his way through the experience. And that got him pretty curious. I mean, could this possibly happen? be happening with other people? And the more he began to explore that, the more he began to see that there, there, people do seem to get confused at times when they've passed out of the body. Many of them still think that they are living in this physical reality and are simply not aware of it. So, for instance, he would have... He would encounter soldiers who were still battling with swords, uh, and even though they had long since left their bodies, and yet they were so preoccupied with it, they simply could not disengage from the battle. And so this was the beginning of the Lifeline program to provide a service to help people to recognize where they are and to begin to move on to the next step. 
So, Paul, I want to bring it back to your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you have a background as a minister, um, in your book you you speak about the teachings of Jesus quite a bit. And um, it's, it's very interesting to hear your interpretation of biblical teachings as opposed to, you know, what the standard religion, like I was raised Catholic, so it's all very fear. And one of the things that you mention in your book is how fear hinders spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about that? Well, from my perspective, and again, this is my perspective, and uh, can I, I, before I get into this, let me throw out a, a caveat here, because I want people to understand that I wear two hats. One is as the executive director of the Monroe Institute, and with that hat on, uh, I want people to understand that uh, we have no particular dogma at the Institute. We're not aligned with any religion whatsoever. We take a very neutral stance to that. And the only piece of dogma that we ask people to consider is the possibility that they might be more than their physical body. We don't try to tell them what that more is. We just create the the context for their own exploration. So that's one hat I wear. The other hat was comes out of my years of being a Presbyterian pastor and, and, and my desire to integrate what I think Jesus was trying to achieve uh, in his ministry with uh, this this work that we do do is the Monroe Institute, but also work that's done by many other organizations to help people to explore the the vast ranges of human perception. So uh, that's 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 where I'm coming from. So when I'm answering this question, I've got the the hat on as author of the Hitch, Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. From my perspective. Um, there, there is a lot of fear that is often uh, uh, preached in the in the church, and well, I think part of the reason for that is because it, it tends to be a fairly lucrative thing when you can get people um, worried or frightened, and <laughs> they're they're more apt to to follow what you're going to say and and to to give. But I don't really think that that was what Jesus was about at all. I I really think that that he was uh, someone who himself explored quite quite vastly in his own inner world. He would spend a great deal of time in prayer and meditation. And I think that he was trying to help his disciples to do the same. For instance, there was the story of going to the Mount of Transfiguration where he took three of his disciples with him. And in that altered state, uh, they were able to see him engaging Moses and Elijah in conversation. And Moses and Elijah, in in theory, were dead long, long before that, many, many years in front of that. And yet, uh, here they were, appearing alive uh, to Jesus and, and to the disciples. So I think that that's one example of, of the possibilities that, that lie in front of us. And so, uh, from my perspective, Jesus is not somebody who we necessarily are... Uh, that we have to worship. I think he was showing us what the the human potential is that that is available to each of us. He said to his disciples, "These things that I do, you will do, and more." And I think that that's something that that is often forgotten in the church and, and is shrouded uh, because we get preoccupied with fear and punishment. And I'm not sure that's that's what we're what Jesus was about at all. Um, and speaking of fear and punishment, um, in the Bible. I- is it in Genesis? I don't know. It's when the, the Adam and Eve in the garden. Yes. And they eat from the tree of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And they weren't supposed to do that, and now they're in big trouble. So why is why is it, it is it such a sin in the Bible that they ate from this tree? Well, I, I don't think it really says in the Bible that it was a sin. It says that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. And the serpent uh, convinces them that that's, that's a fallacy, and so they go ahead and eat from it anyway. Um, but in order, from my perspective, you have to back up a little bit more and, and put that story in a larger context. And, and that larger context comes from the first chapter of Genesis, where God creates the heavens and the earth. And what that the process of creation is very interesting, the way it's, it's laid out there in Genesis, because it's not so much a process of creation as it is a process of separation. The separation light from dark, the dry land from the seas, the waters above from the waters below, the animals in the sky versus the animals in, on the land, and so on and so forth. And at each step of the way, even though there's this set, these separations that are happening, God says, and it is good. He looked upon everything and it was good. And then at, at the end of it, of course, the last separation is between male and female. 
And then uh, when God looks at all the separations together, God says, it is very good. So you've got a situation here where you've got all these polarities and dichotomies that are set up, and yet there's not one of them that's good and evil. It's, they're both good. You can't, uh, we are people who can perceive because of contrast. You can't tell what's light unless there's darkness. So all of this is, in all of its completion, very, very good. But then when you come to the uh, story of the Garden of Evil, uh, excuse me, the Garden of Eden, they are told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so in eating from that tree, what, they're, what we're really doing is we're taking all of this goodness that is in front of us, all of these polarities, all these dualities, and we're trying to say that one side is good and the other is evil. And that's when we fall out of the, the consciousness of Eden in which we have this great relationship with the, with the divine. And then we find that we're, we're kind of cast out of the garden and living this life that is uh, captivated by duality. So for me, it's a question of the the shift in consciousness that happens when we take on this mantle of judgment. And Paul, you also mentioned in your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, that uh, Jesus mentions Satan, uh, the word Satan, a lot in the Old Testament. But your interpretation of the word Satan isn't necessarily the same as the one that we commonly think of when we... Yes, I mean, Jesus, it wasn't Jesus in the Old Testament. It was the, I was talking about the Old Testament itself, and, and in outside of the Book of Job, I think the, the uh, word Satan is only mentioned about three times. So it's, uh, Satan is not a big character in the Old Testament at all. And when it's used there, it's it's more from um, as somebody who is the adversary, but not in, in an enemy kind of way, but more from uh, someone who is performing the function of a prosecuting attorney within the divine court. And that's certainly the, the position that uh, Satan takes in uh, the book of Job as well, where he very much plays out that role. So within, within the Old Testament, which is a Jewish book, uh, you don't have this uh, dichotomy between God and, and the devil or God and Satan, uh, because the Jewish perspective is that there's only one God. And they're, they're, their religion is based on the idea of monotheism. And I think that uh, what happened over the years in, in the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were uh, outside influences that started to come in. And so you moved uh, more from a, a monotheistic religion to particularly in the Christian tradition where you've got a, a much more dualistic pers- per, uh, perspective on things. And I'm, I think that, that I'm, I'm not quite so sold on that as, as the way to look at things. I'm wondering... How do you combine your religious background with a more scientific exploration of consciousness like they use at the Monroe Institute? Well, uh, it's, it's been kind of a long process for me, and um, I, it, for me it, it really has its genesis in this hunger that I felt when I, in my younger days to, to explore this more fully. So it was more a question of looking for what fit the explanation best for my own personal experience. We we always tend to think that um, our, our beliefs are the most important thing, and we we hold on to our beliefs so tightly that uh, we actually will will fight to the death for them. And and they really are very important because they give us a sense of place in the world. They order the way that we perceive the world. They give us a sense of some sense of safety. But uh, part of the process of, of opening up is to to suspend your beliefs just long enough so that you might be able to learn something unexpected or something new. And so for me, I, I because of this this desire was so strong and, the, and this um, this hunger to uh, explore these other worlds was so powerful. I I when I didn't find. Um, when I didn't find what I was looking for in one area, I felt compelled to look for it in some other way until I could find something that would satisfy uh, my curiosity. And so while, you know, I looked within the Christian tradition, and, and it, it genuinely is there when you, when you examine the biblical text, you can find all kinds of examples of people moving into altered states of consciousness or other, other states of perception, you know, people encountering angels or like Ezekiel in, in his vision of a wheel within a wheel or Abraham hearing the voice of God, um, uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. I mean, there are countless examples within the biblical text, but, but for some reason within 
standard religion, we, we don't pay attention to that so much. So I found myself really having to, to look in other areas where, uh, where I could find sort of a, a community of people who were, were interested in this to, to provide me some kind of support. And uh, I, was, I was up in Toronto, Canada with my wife at one point. It was a couple of years into the ministry. And we walked into the world's biggest bookstore. That, that's it, its name even to this day. And there, was, there were just thousands upon thousands of books there. And all of a sudden, one book just jumped off the shelf at me. And that was Robert Monroe's second book. I read it cover to cover, and I couldn't put the thing down because here was somebody who was talking about some of the experiences that I had had when I fell off the roof. But he wasn't using theology or he wasn't using philosophy to speculate about these things. He was simply telling about his own experience. That, for me, was really compelling because when you know something through your own personal experience, it's a much more uh, powerful sense of, of understanding than you can get through hearing somebody else talk about it or reading it through a book. So when I read the, that book and it connected so well with my own experience, and when I saw at the end of it that there was a place that you could go to study this, which was called the Monroe Institute, boy, if I could have gone in that moment, I would have done it. But as a Presbyterian pastor, I didn't have a lot of discretionary income or even a lot of discretionary time. So uh, it took me 10 years to get here. And and when I did, um, I found what I was looking for, which is that that world opened up for me all over again in, in living technicolor. And it was so wondrous and so marvelous that when I came home, I tried to tell my wife about it and and all I could do was t- uh, cry tears of joy because there simply weren't words for it. And, you know, when I think about uh, Jesus and he talked about the kingdom of heaven as being something like a-, a priceless pearl that you might find that you would trade everything for to get, I never understood that parable until I had those experiences of moving into these other ranges of wonder and magic and mystery. And it was that important to me. I would have given anything that, that I had to be able to attain it. And then when I came to the Monroe Institute, it actually opened up for me. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. And I, just before we wrap up, there's one question. I don't know. It's kind of an aside, mm-hmm. um, but it just came to me. Um, I'm wondering, do you ever have any anesthesiologists come to the Monroe Institute? Because they work on the different levels of consciousness, right? Yes, um, and I can't think of anybody right offhand, but I'm sure we have. You know, we've had some 30,000 people go through the Institute, and I I would be very surprised if we didn't have an anesthesiologist or two. But, you know, those guys are are, um, inevitably are going to encounter people who have had experiences of leaving their body during surgery and and then being able to come back and and give some of the details of what were happening while they were supposedly unconscious. And I'm I'm sure that uh, some of them are are open to that and some of them are not. Those who are not simply won't even engage those conversations. But those who are, you know, it it really... uh, it really can make an impact, and there's, of course, there's a lot of study that is is done in that area, and a, a lot of chronicling of of those experiences. So, yes, it's a very important thing. Wonderful. Well, it's time to wrap up the show in just a moment. So, I wanted to give you the floor if there's anything that you'd like to add. Well, I think for for me, the uh, one of the things that I always want to urge people to do is to um, to to begin to explore these things on their own, whether they come to the Monroe Institute or whether they go somewhere else, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that they pay attention to that deep yearning that each of us has if we will um, give it notice. Because there's there's sort of an internal barometer that we that we carry with us, and it, and it is that yearning, it is that, that deep desire that tells us that there is more to this world than meets the eye. And if we will give that some space and, and allow it to open up, it, it can take us on some pretty marvelous adventures. I think that each of us have, have come into this world with a very precious gift that we are to offer the world. And that precious gift begins when we open up to the fullness of what it means to be human. And the key to that is to follow that deep yearning, that deep passion that you might be feeling, but you, maybe you're a little bit afraid to follow it. But it's there, and it's there for a purpose, and trust it. Awesome. Well, if people want to get in touch with you or get your book, A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, what's the best way to find you? 
they can uh, call at the Institute. Uh, the number here is uh, 434-361-1500. They can go to our website, which is monroeinstitute.org. That's M-O-N-R-O-E institute.org. They can uh, go to my website, which is spiritualhitchhiker.com, and the book is available through uh, Amazon and also through Barnes & Noble. Awesome. Well, it's been fantastic having you on the show. It's been a great joy for me, Marie. Thank you so much, Paul. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. So that was Paul Rademacher. He is the executive director of the Monroe Institute and author of A Spiritual Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. A very interesting hour. Thank you so much for being with me. Thanks to the caller who called in. And I hope that you have a fantastic weekend. It's been such a pleasure to be with you. And we'll be back with more synchronicity next week at 9 a.m.